Hello and welcome to our panel for today with the title How Platforms Can Share Investors Through Liquidity and Fractionalization. A difficult word for a German like me. Um, for the audience, um, if you have any questions for the attendees, please write it into the chat or into the Q&A section and um, we will use it later for the Q&A session. And yeah, for you guys here in the panel, um, please ask questions under each other, but you know already the game to make it more active. Um, before we start with the content, I would like to ask you guys for a brief introduction of who you are and just very short from my side. Uh, I'm Lars, I'm an online entrepreneur and investor since uh, 2015 in P2P lending. And I try to develop and help this industry with my blog and the community. And yeah, let's continue with Jetin maybe. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jatin, CEO of Shojin Property Partners. We're a UK-based real estate investment platform. Uh, as a business we've run since 2009, we launched an online platform in 2017, and we tend to specialize in providing junior funding for real estate developers, predominantly in the UK, but we are now starting to do international projects as well. Okay, thanks. Atuksha? Hi everyone, I'm Atiksha, um, co-founder and MD of Simple Crowdfunding. It's a property investment platform based in the UK and we offer both equity and peer-to-peer -peer lending. Okay, and then let's go over to Jan. Hello, uh, my name is Jan Vecherka and I'm the founder of BrickApp. Um, we have built BrickApp as a platform for um, aggregating data and aggregating the realistic crowdfunding market. And recently we have opened a marketplace to allow everyone to invest directly to investment opportunities, which originally came from uh, other uh, risk funding platforms. And we are developing uh, Recap as a software platform. So therefore we offer uh, our software solution to other uh, risk developers who want to get into crowdfunding and build their own platform as well. So that's what we are focusing on. Okay, very interesting. And uh, Ali. Hi, I'm uh, founder and CEO of British Pearl, um, a regulated real estate investment platform based in the UK. Um, we operate both an equity and debt model. Um, we've been in the market for quite some time now, uh, and we're very proud to be part of the ARIP uh, community, which is the alternative real estate investment platform community, the members of which you see around this table now. Okay, yeah, we will come to this um, later. So the main topic um, today is um, how platforms can share investors through liquidity and fractionalization. But uh, what does it mean and um, why it is important? Maybe Ali, you can uh, continue right now. Sure, thank you. Um, so uh, the, the initiative that um, we've put together as a group, um, including the other platforms uh, present on this call, and there are a number of other platforms who are not present on this call uh, from other European countries, is we've put together a trade association uh, called the Association of Real Estate Investment Platforms. You can find that at areep.org. That's A-R-E-I-P.org. The purpose being um, is to help build trust and integrity in the market, to build investor trust, um, and uh, regulatory um, and operational integrity in the market. Um, ultimately, uh, what we're attempting to do, the way you build trust is through standardization. This has been demonstrated in um, uh, mature capital markets um, uh, over many, many years. Um, the standardization that we're currently working on and we've completed version one of is the standardization of investment descriptions um, so we've looked at all the possible types of real estate projects that our um, investment platform members um, um, facilitate and created a, uh, a data sheet off the, off the back of that, which then spits out an investment description. And this is really to help um, uh, retail investors and other inter interested participants to easily see what an investment um, opportunity um, uh, entails uh, and this at uh, the second step uh, from that was then to start building um, a risk ratings model off the back of that and we've also completed version one of that um, we've been working on this for the last year 
and we're quite proud of where we've got to and we've just now launched as an association and are looking for new members the standardization process we anticipate will continue um, uh, for some time as we bring on new members it's uh, it's an ever evolving and improving process uh, and ultimately where we want to get to is creating a, a central marketplace where all um, investment platforms um, or members of our association uh, participate to list their deals in, in one central place and invite their investors. And um, what we anticipate will happen through time is that investors who come through the platform, for example, will see interesting, um, other interesting opportunities presented by other platforms. And there'll be, um, uh, we anticipate a cross pollination um, of investors um, through time. Uh, um, that we see benefits to all members um, by having a central marketplace that has standardized investments, building investor trust, and thereby liquidity as well. Uh, we anticipate the central marketplace aspect of our mission um, will take uh, a little bit more time uh, to, to realize, given the amount of operational, regulatory, and other work that needs to, uh, needs to uh, be undertaken. Okay, is this um, association more interesting for smaller or also big ones, big platforms? Because you just mentioned this uh, central marketplace um, and then yes. comes well, to my mind, okay, they can collect easy money uh, over the central marketplace. So um, the, the association is an association, an international association, although it was started by um, seven platforms from across Europe, three from the UK, four from Europe, um, for launch, we've already had another, um, I think, uh, five platforms join us for, from four more locations, such as Spain, Latvia, Dubai, and India. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what we're looking to do is to build an international presence, um, uh, including from small platforms through to larger platforms. Obviously, in, um, having the larger platforms interested in our initiative uh, may take a little bit more work um, uh, by the nature of having a larger business. You're probably a little bit more self-reliant uh, and potentially skeptical of, about joining a group um, who are looking to launch a central marketplace. Uh, but ultimately, we see benefits to all types of members of all sizes, um, especially in Europe at the moment where the regulatory environment is, is, is new. Uh, to say if you're a new or, or young platform, uh, to communicate to your local regulator that you're working with an association that has members who've been regulated for some time. So, for example, members from the UK or potentially the US who have learned from um, operating over a number of years and who have started to establish their own standards. I think there could only be a benefit uh, to new platforms communicating that to their local regulators. Can I can I just just quickly add to that as well? And and I think this is a really really important distinction, where you know across the world, you know the the online real estate investment market, you know whether you call it crowdfunding or peer to peer, it's still really in its infancy as as a as as a real kind of part of the market, a mainstream part of the market. And part of the goal here is to bring that into the mainstream, so people do consider it alongside mainstream investments. However, because the market is so fragmented, you've got different types of platform, different types of qualities as well. One of the goals here is, you know, it's recognizing that an investor investing, say, in the Shogun platform will be mostly focusing on UK real estate development. But then really, as part of diversification, they should be looking at other opportunities as well. So I don't know, a project in Spain, for example, that we, we're not involved in at all. So the idea here is to, is to really bring together some of the, the, the best platforms because quality is absolutely paramount in this. And one of the problems we've seen over the last few years is a lot of uh, smaller platforms, they launch, they start doing business in this space, and then they end up blowing themselves up because they don't have the right controls in place, the risk measures and all of those things. So what we're trying to do is not just bring that standardization, but kind of bring that clarity and bring quality platforms together, which we believe will benefit each individual platform as well, because you will then cross pollinate investors, somebody investing in our platform, if they want to do some 
uh, senior funding in something uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, they know, for example, that uh, a simple uh, is it simple equity, simple crowdfunding is is you know they focus on that side as well. So so they they might feel a bit more comfortable doing that or one of um, uh, the the projects on on Ali's platform, which is which might be an asset investment, which we don't do as much. So it's really about about bringing good platforms together and then giving investors that choice and transparency across all the products. And I would like to uh, add one more thing to it because uh, here are really, the market is very fragmented and in Europe, there are more than 160 uh, active uh, real estate crowdfunding platforms just in Europe and uh, hundreds all around the world. And what, what we found out is that it is very difficult for a user to really compare different products from different platforms from different regions and uh, our real goal is to standardize that to standardize that uh, an investment at one platform uh, can be compared to investment at, at another platform and for example as Jatin mentioned that uh, each of our platforms focuses on something a bit different but in one uh, marketplace or just when we standardize the data, standardize uh, deals, standardize information, it could be, uh, it will be very beneficial for the investors. And it can bring more investors to, uh, just not to our platforms, but to the whole industry. I think, Jan, you've done a very good job on um, highlighting the customer benefit. Um, and I, my best guess is Lars, as a, correct me if I'm wrong, Lars, you're probably an active investor yourself uh, across yes. platforms. Uh, you probably see the immediate, and you've probably experienced going from one platform to another and being presented with um, information in a very different way. If that information could be standardized, uh, like Jan has highlighted, which is the purpose of our association, um, I think it just makes things easier for the customer, um, the investor, um, uh, and through making it easier and simpler to understand, building trust. And ultimately, if you layer on top of that what we think will be a reliable risk rating um, so people can quickly see, based on key investment characteristics, where that falls on the risk spectrum, um, I think we'll see a big uptake uh, and activity uh, in the market. And it is important to say that we have uh, started Arip uh, with uh, seven uh, platforms at the beginning. And even in this relatively small uh, number of platforms, a relatively small group, it was quite difficult already to really standardize even our uh, information, our uh, investments, and to compare it, or just to you know standardize that one investment project at one platform means the same thing on the other platform. And after that, we uh, once we did that, this like we call it terminology, we focused on another topic, which is uh, risk uh, assessment of projects to like com really compare. Uh, different risk profile of investment at one platform to the other platform. And we spend really a lot of time on building that uh, risk model. What's What's been really nice with this is as part of the standardization, it's helped. Um, we're all in real estate, but everyone has a different flavor of real estate in terms of what they're offering. And by bringing platforms together, having this conversation, allows everyone to also understand how others are operating in this space um, within regulation, within um, the crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending community. And that's actually been really nice. So as, as, as Jan mentioned, the standardization piece took a bit of time to achieve, but that's because there were so many different parameters to accommodate for. Now, from an investor standpoint, this is a really good thing because it allows investors to understand and be able to compare apples with apples rather than apples with oranges. So that's a really good thing because it does bring that standardization to place. But the other thing it does is for new platforms or um, platforms that are maybe at the earliest stage of their development, 
it probably highlights a million things they haven't even thought about um, in terms of the, the considerations that should be made maybe when evaluating projects. And so actually having this um, joint understanding actually brings out the best in everyone. And that's a really nice place to be. And, and I, actually on that, um, on Atuksha's point as well, if, if I may take that one step further, and this is full credit to everyone that was involved in ARI. You know, if you think about it, most people are business owners and uh, as in within ARI. And, um, you know, as a business owner, when you start off in this space, you start off thinking you want to be the marketplace, you want to own it, you want to be the Neff Jeff Bezos or, you know, someone that owns the entire thing. But the reality is the world has changed. In the last 20 years, the world has changed a lot. And it's no longer about that winner-takes-all mentality. And actually, you know, this is by working in collaboration, by sharing everything you're doing, by opening yourself up to others within the industry, you get the absolute best result for everyone, the investors, but also your own businesses. And, and that in my view, is the way businesses should be growing. If you take Amazon, which is great, obviously, but if you look at the way it's, they've done it, they've, you know, they've got all the third-party people who are selling through there, but really, who, who gets the ultimate benefit of it? It's the guys or the company at the top. What we're trying to do here is turn the whole thing around and say, well, actually, if we create this central marketplace together, we can own it together, and it will benefit investors, so it becomes a win-win for absolutely everyone. And that, in my view, is the future of business. Are you focused with ARI on a special type of projects? Because if we um, see, for example, Reinvest24, they are not here, unfortunately, today. But they have, for example, business loans, they have development loans, they have rental projects. Are you focused on a special type of, uh, of projects? Or can you standardize everything? Just real estate, hence the title. But anything within the real estate spectrum. Yes. So, you know, we, I mean, we, we had a project recently. So every project we're putting out, we're trying to put within the ARI framework now to calculate the risk scores. Um, but we did find that there was a project recently that we did that didn't neatly fit within the ARI framework. And that's okay because it's not a common product. Uh, we were buying wholesale units, a, a big batch of units, selling them into the retail market. Um, and, and that didn't fit within the ARI framework. So, so these are the types of evolution, you know, the, the type of evolution that needs to happen within the risk score. But the, the way the, the, the risk metrics and the risk scoring has been structured so far, it does cover a lot of the market, including asset investments, loans, first charge, second charge, equity, preferred equity. So it does cover quite a lot, but it's never going to be a finished product. We're always going to be looking to evolve that, uh, again, through the collaboration with other platforms. And actually, that's... The, the beauty of it, this whole marketplace is about creativity and doing things slightly differently. So what we don't want to do is be in a position where we're boxing things off um, because it doesn't allow for that flair um, in terms of real estate. And there are so many unusual types of projects that um, we see all the time. We should embrace them all and um, try and accommodate for them where we can. Yeah. So you are mainly focused on, on the good and solid work on the platform side. Um, what are the requirements for a platform to join your association? Can everyone join or what are the hurdles? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Ali? I think I can share this uh, response with the Tuxia for sure. Um, we have two types of members. Um, we or people who join ARIP. We've got ARIP members and ARIP supporters. ARIP members will be um, those creating the investment products themselves, so the investment platforms, um, uh, the regulated ones who where there's regulation is required, and uh, are those who are unregulated and becoming regulated, um, as is happening in Europe at the moment. Um, really what we're looking for from investors at the moment is that they buy into the vision that was highlighted by Jatin earlier, uh, which was, you know, and, Jet, and well, everybody around this table, that they buy into the standardization process. 
that they'll participate as part of the standardization process, which will contribute to the evolution and improvement of standardization. As we said earlier, um, you know, we had seven uh, platforms around the table, um, all with different um, uh, investment products. As we have more members joining, uh, there will be other variations to those investment products, and hence the standardization process will need to accommodate for that. Um, so we would like a potential member to buy into um, uh, the standardization process, buy into uh, what we're trying to achieve as our vision, and uh, are in line with our uh, um, you know company um, goals in terms of trust, transparency, um, et cetera, which we highlight on our, on our website. Yeah. Atuksha, would you like to add to yeah. that? Yeah. So um, in terms, it's really important that people are embracing this marketplace, um, embrace regulation where it's required. And so from a member standpoint, that's really important. We also have um, supporters. So if and, and supporters can be anyone who um, supports this this industry and this marketplace. So it could be lawyers, it could be accountants, it could be um, property professionals. We, you know, the list is endless, I suppose, in that regard. And it is about um, sort of sharing ideas across the board. Um, there is a, a registration process that we go through. So people apply to become members or supporters. Um, it then gets discussed at the committee just to make sure that um, you know it fulfills the requirements and then people can join. And the more the merrier, quite frankly. So it's good to have that um, the, the, the varying uh, viewpoints from around the world because everyone's operating in different, um, they're, they're providing real estate in different ways um, across different jurisdictions. And it'd be really nice to understand what is actually happening on a global basis in real terms. We obviously have an idea of what is happening across the world, but to actually have platforms from different places who are embracing it right now there, I think is 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 a really powerful thing. There's also no cost to join at the moment. Very important, um, yeah. Yeah, and we're, um, uh, so far, the costs that we have incurred have just been borne by the existing members with the goal of really getting this uh, moving. Um, ultimately, we'll need to have uh, membership fees at some point in the future to cover our administrative costs. But our goal really at the moment is to get as many um, good heads around the table uh, to make this, uh, you know, move this forward and um, improve our standardization process and make the central market pace a reality. And, and the reason that we've incurred the costs and spent the time on this is because we truly believe in it. And it's really important because to have a single voice, one, to have the standardization in place helps people understand and be able to compare. That's really important um, because all of these things go towards helping this marketplace um, become more regular, I suppose, um, and become more commonplace. So that's one area. The second is by having... Um, a number of platforms sharing ideas and having these conversations as a single voice is also really important when it comes to having conversations with the regulators, with policy makers. And um, ultimately, we are in a regulated space in the majority of cases. And we need to make sure that um, we have a seat at the table. And this allows us to do that. Um, and it's a, it's a single voice, you know, you have 20 brains sat around a table, all with a different perspective, you're going to come up with a pretty good answer, I would have thought. And so having that, um, that insight is also really important in terms of helping 
to grow this um, this whole area moving forwards. Interestingly, Lars, um, if you don't mind me adding um, to what Atuksha said, uh, one of the platforms that we spoke to recently said that the, their local regulator wanted them to communicate to their um, investor community certain aspects of their investments. And that's actually what we've been working on. The, 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 um, the data sheet, the investment description, that standardized, standardized process highlights everything that we think uh, as a group should, it should be communicated to investors clearly. Um, and if that platform was a member of ours, they could have taken our sheet and, and just shared it with the regulator. And that gives regulators a lot of confidence um, that there's guidance from more experienced platforms in the market for new entrants uh, and that actually this this has been well thought through. Um, probably better thought through than a regulator could do themselves on their own because they're not market practitioners. Uh, and we see this a lot in the UK when um, the FCA wants to change policy um, or, Im or, or um, implement policy they'll often reach out to practitioners in the market um, to gather opinions. And once they've gathered all those opinions, can they come to a more intelligent, thoughtful uh, conclusion? Uh, well, we're helping with that. So, you know, we're, we're sort of doing the regulators job for them. Good for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, Tell us a little bit more about this uh, onboarding process. Um, for example, if a new platform is coming and uh, want to be a member of yours, um, what, they, what they have to do to, to be a member? Well, it's relatively simple. Um, you go to the website, um, there is a join form. It's a very short join form um, and you apply. Uh, we're, we're clear on the website what our goals are. So hopefully the member at that point has read that. But once somebody has um, uh, reached out to us to join, uh, we will be the committee will be communicating with them, ensuring that um, uh, they're clear on what our goals are. Uh, and then uh, as a committee, we'll be discussing whether that um, uh, platform that is applying should join. Now, the hurdle um, uh, in terms of what needs to be done by the ap applicant is relatively low in terms of um, the effort that they need to put in. Um, but the reputational part aspect of who's joining is important to us, which is why there is a check at the committee level. So there is a dis there will be, and there has been, a discussion about every applicant uh, and wh whether they should be joining or not. They'll probably also have to suffer a conversation with one of us. So, you know, but how bad can it be, right, Lars? <laughs> And but I think it's very, as, uh, very important is, to, to check them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What is what is important for us to uh, to discuss uh, with a new member of the association as well as their like vision, how they want to participate in the association. If they just want to be a supporter, or uh, if they want to really uh, contribute to the vision of the association, both ways are fine. But it is important to know in which direction they want to contribute, and as well as what is important is that uh, they contribute to uh, the standardization standardization of uh, data and that they uh, have it, it doesn't need to be immediate but in let's say uh, in some time a vision to implement these standards to their platform hmm. and, you and make... I guess, um, yes, so, so, sorry just to just to add to that you know and, and this is kind of coming back to the cost element i know uh, uh, ali and atoksha referred to this earlier you know while there's no financial cost obviously members can join and not be heavily involved but really what we are also looking for is people to be heavily involved the biggest cost in my view is the cost of your time you know what you've got around the table is ceos or very senior people at the organizations you know for them to take a couple of hours out uh, of their busy schedule you know every couple of weeks it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot. And then there's homework as well to make sure that everybody goes and does what they need to do and bring bring some value back. So, so while you can be a pretty silent member, we are definitely looking for active members. So if, if people are you know really want to get involved, then really join up. 
Do, we, do you make a difference between a regulated and unregulated uh, platforms, or it doesn't matter for you? I think it's probably easier to onboard a regulated platform for you because um, there are already some background checks done. But um, or, or do you yeah. make any difference? So with regulated platforms, um, absolutely. One of the things we will consider is if there are platforms that are unregulated, then we just need to have a conversation in terms of what they're looking to do moving forwards as well. Um, and it might be that at the moment they can't be a fully blown mem member, but they could still be a supporter. They're still a fan of this space. So, it, and it's just actually having those conversations. And I appreciate that there are certain jurisdictions right now where the regulation is changing and, and with, so in Europe, for example, you don't actually have to be regulated just yet, but it's moving that way. And so as long as platforms are sort of moving in that direction and will be applying, then that's fine. We just need, and, and every jurisdiction is different. And because we're a global um, trade body, we have to look at those on a case by case basis, which is why it then goes to committee for discussion. So um, it will stabilize as we have more platforms on board and we have more experiences from different countries. Um, so that will stabilize, but at the moment, this is, th this is the process. But it's about, ultimately the trade body is about inclusion. And so it's finding the best way to get people involved within the trade body. So, and that's really important to get across. Yeah, I would like to add to this, just uh, what is really important for us is to check if the platform uh, is doing, uh, regarding the regulation, if they are compliant with the current regulation on their market. That is really important. And exactly as Atuksha mentioned, uh, if it is a market where, for example, it is a case, for example, here in the Czech Republic, and it, which is very similar, for example, to Germany or other countries that, for example, risk take crowdfunding is not regulated per se, but there are some like other regulations which uh, need, which makes uh, a platform compliant. That, for example, in our case, it means that all the investors' money needs to be uh, separated from a platform. We need to have a um, a regulated uh, company or regulated payment services provider uh, for all the money flow. For example, this is how it works here locally. So we are looking for such such things that uh, to make sure that the platform does uh, the, the their business properly based on the regulation on the specific market. And if if I may, the the, the opposite also applies. You know the. Just because someone's regulated doesn't make them a good platform. So there's a lot more that will go into the assessment because at the end of the day, we're all um, uh, hooking our wagons together in a sense. You know, by having other people within the association, I'm kind of saying, you know, yes, we 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 believe in what they're doing, and so for our investors, they get an immediate sense of trust in the other platform. So we need to make sure that whoever's within our we're comfortable not just with the fact that they've regulated or that they're meeting whatever regulations are, but actually we like their way of doing business as well. Yeah. So what has, has ARI changed so far in your companies or maybe already in, in the industry? Um, since you talked the first time about this topic, can you already report something that has changed? Or is it still that early? I, I mean, that on, on, on our end, I can give you an immediate uh, response to that. So, so while, while Arib hadn't formally been launched, so we couldn't formally state it as being Arib, we actually held a risk workshop uh, a few weeks ago where we went through two of our projects, but we overlaid the Arib risk framework with that. So kind of talking about how we're looking at each element of risk and therefore what kind of impact it has on the overall risk score to demonstrate how two different projects will have two different ratings and it's based on a number of things. I think within the investor community, I think there's the, 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 there's still a lot of, um, uh, I wouldn't call it misinformation, but maybe a misunderstanding 
about different projects and what they mean and what the returns mean. You know, first of all, you get people that will just look at the returns and say, oh, that one's got a bigger return than that one. I'll go for the higher return. Not really grasping that there are there's a reason that the returns are different. Not to say that the one with a higher return is a bad project, but they need to understand how to compare these things. Um, you know, the, the other big misconception is, I don't know, a product paying 6% versus a product paying 24%. Is the 24% product four times more risky than the 6% product? Not necessarily. And there's a lot of other elements that come into play there. So, so, so we actually had this workshop where we went through all of this, again, without specifically naming Ari because it hadn't been launched. But the, the feedback and the response on that was huge. People loved it and they loved the idea of that, which is why, you know, with Ari now launched, we're very excited to, in fact, um, I think pretty much today or tomorrow, or every project on our platform will have the ARIC risk sheet, which is like a one page uh, description of the project, but ultimately then has the risk rating based on the underlying uh, risk scoring methodology. Yeah, I can add to that that uh, in Brickhead, we have already collected a lot of data uh, from uh, the property crowdfunding industry and uh, the spreadsheet with which. Uh, which I didn't mention, uh, we have analyzed a lot of, of the da data based on the spreadsheet and we received really interesting uh, outcomes out of that and uh, which help to for the comparison of different projects. And so that's the value we feel is uh, what we are helping the industry. And this um, sheet is already uh, public? From now it is, yeah. To, okay. uh, so if you go to the ARI website, you'll see a lot of information about the risk framework. You can download a document which, which goes through it in more detail. Um, only members have the underlying kind of scoring, specific scoring methodology. That's part of the whole membership thing. But that also then means you can actually say that this is an ARI, um, is it ARI approved? ARI compliant uh, uh, statement because our, our risk sheet will then say it's ARIC compliant because the actual scoring is based on the ARIC framework. And that, that will be very powerful because not only is that a good sales tool for the individual platforms, but as I said, investors have been, while not loudly, you know, they have been crying out for something like this because it's, it's a mess out there. You know, it's very difficult for investors to really understand all the different products offered by the different platforms. Definitely. But also, um, in terms of, you know, we have templates in place, so the information's already there. You, you populate the spreadsheets with your projects. It'll throw out the, the required template and all of that stuff for you. A lot's been done in the background. And, um, you know, from our platform, from Simple standpoint, we've been tracking the AREP um, methodology against what we currently have. And have been using for years so um and it, it's been really interesting to actually sort of look at that and we're incorporating some of some changes as a result of it so but these things take time um to do it's not something you can just literally flick a switch and say from tomorrow i'm going to start the new way it just doesn't work that way so there is an education piece that needs to happen in the meantime and now that we um, are now that we've launched, we can actually start talking about it in the marketplace. Before it was just we need to do the underlying foundational work in order to be in a position where everything was ready to go. And it took it took a lot of time and effort to do, but we we got there. Um, so and that's quite exciting. So now we can start talking about it. So there should be more developments coming. And actually, I think um, the biggest impact this will have, at least in the short term, is probably in Europe, quite frankly, because the European platforms that are going for authorization to actually have standardized processes and, and templates and all of that available already in terms of reviews will actually, I think, help. Yeah. I saw that you already um, registered also um, a company. It's called uh, also AREAP Limited. I think, um, Ali, you are chairman of this company. Um, do you have also a roadmap um, public or some kind of business plan you can, you can 
talk about? Uh, actually, it's not just me that's a, a director. Uh, the um, uh, I just saw it in the company register. Yeah, yeah. The company registers uh, in the process of being updated. Uh, but um, we incorporated in the UK um, because, frankly, incorporating a company and getting banking uh, services in the UK um, is much easier versus our European rivals. Um, you can set up an account. Sorry, you can set up a, a company within 24 hours uh, and you can set up a bank account much not, um, you know, it doesn't take much longer to do. Uh, so, which is why we selected the UK to incorporate uh, ARIP. Um, but we're certainly, you know, we're a European born institution uh, with an international uh, aspiration and international membership. Um, we don't see ourselves as UK centric or European centric um, based on, you know, using the same uh, philosophy um, as Jatin was earlier about inclusion um, in the way we approach things. Which actually, you know, we, we've heard the, the word crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending. All of this is about a collective, a collective of investors uh, um, from different places in the world, a collective of projects, a collective of platforms. You know, uh, inclusion is very uh, important to us. Um, so although we've set up in, um, uh, in the UK, we're certainly not a UK-centric um, institution. I, I just, I really want to make that very clear. Um, and the uh, directorship of the trade association um, is also not one person. The shareholdership will not be one person. It will be its members. Um, uh, again, inclusion. So what you see currently at Companies House is the uh, the day is the status of the day it was incorporated. Um, so one one uh, person, myself, and one institution. I, I was the administrator of it. Um, uh, and that's where that's got to so far. The aspirations of ARIP Limited are the aspirations of ARIP uh, organization and its members. Okay, understood. But uh, let's come back to the to the plans for ARIP um, for this year. Do you have some some roadmap? Oh, uh, the, uh, apologies for not addressing that question. Sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent. <laughs> no problem. The, the um, our, our launch aspirations were to get the standardization version one standardization process and um, risk rating uh, up and running, which we've done. And the website's up and we've tried to make the website as clear as possible. That will evolve from now onwards. Now that we've had our official uh, launch um, um, this week with Finfellas and, and a number of news articles that have come out about us and our, our new launch members, Really, the only goal that I see that's um, uh, a priority is growing the membership and supporter base. So that's our goal now. We've done some valuable work, the institution set up. Now we want more people behind us. As we get more people behind us, the standardization process will evolve. And then we'll start, um, uh, you know, going down the road of, setting the foundation to launch the um, centralized marketplace. As I said earlier, that's a big piece of work, the centralized marketplace. So we anticipate that taking more time. But what should not take much more time is growing our membership base. I, I would add a step in the middle, actually. Um, so with regards to now that we've got the, the initial foundations in place, that's great. That's a tick. Um, having more members and supporters on board, it's about strength in numbers. And um, that will help us because we then, we've all been working on this wholeheartedly for a year. And so we see what we see. And so by having um, other people coming in at this point will also be good because they might bring a completely different perspective that's not being considered. So that will then help state finalize, I suppose, and um, fine tune what's already been done. And that's a really important step. The marketplace will, um, the, the thought process behind that, there's a lot of work that will need to go into that and that will start. I think there is also a step in the middle though, which is also about engaging um, and, and building, starting to build those relationships 
with the regulators, with the policy makers, with um, influences in the community who are um, who are actively looking at this space in terms of um, where it goes. And we need to be part of those conversations. And I think, um, again, I, I mentioned before, I think Europe, we have a real opportunity to actually be part of that structure and that conversation. Um, I think there is still time to do that in terms of the regulation and where it's going to end up. And that would be a really interesting thing to also focus on. And, and I, I actually, uh, th th that's, that's a very good point on the regulatory side. Um, and th th there is a lot of work, obviously, that's happening on the regulatory side. W one of the core kind of remits of ARIB is actually, yes, there's a regulatory element, but there are multiple kind of national regulatory kind of organizations as well, like the UK Crowdfunding Association. Our goal is very much, um, or, or probably a lot on the commercial side as well, not just commercially, how do we grow our businesses, but commercially, how do we bring this product into the mainstream? And commercially, how do we serve investors better? And, and so, you know, when you consider that side of it, um, there's still a lot of work to go. I mean, if you look at uh, markets that have evolved in the past, financial markets, Ali, it's years and years and years for these things to get to a point where they become mainstream. But, you know, we're taking off one, one piece at a time. The ultimate goal, as, as uh, Ali mentioned earlier, is to move towards this kind of full-blown marketplace where you can have primary and secondary transactions from all various platforms. You can cross-pollinate investors, uh, create that liquidity. You know, all of these things, confidence, but it builds, you know, the liquidity and it, and it, and it just it brings it all into the mainstream. But there is an interim component, um, so something that, that, again, has been discussed and just needs to be fleshed out a bit more as well, but something that should give um, members immediate value in that space as well, which is actually collaborating even before we've got a marketplace, cross-pollinating product. Because once again, you know, for example, we have no presence in Spain, but would our investors like investment in Spain? Yeah, probably. So we can work with platforms that are specialists in, in the Spanish market and we can start providing their products to our platform and vice versa. There is this kind of cross-pollination. We're already doing it with a few international markets already. Um, and, and that's a very simple inter, kind of in-between step that we can take to add value to every platform as we make our way towards this uh, centralized marketplace, which is going to be a hell of a lot of work, let's face it. But we will get there. Okay, yeah, but this um, central marketplace, it sounds very, very interesting. Um, we have some kind of marketplace already in the Baltics. Unfortunately, they are shutting down. It's called Evo Estate. And um, from the investor's perspective, will it, will it be similar to this so that I just need one registration for all your platforms? Or will you just forward the users from your platform to um, a website where they can um, trade? Also? I don't know how. I mean, the way. We are thinking of, of building is, is more uh, de decentralized. So that's not like uh, putting everything together on, on one platform, but to really have like shared marketplace in between the, let's call it independent platforms, but share the investment opportunities in between them. But in, in the long run, remember, all of this actually is still to be confirmed, right? Then there's a lot of complexities involved in having a centralized kind of licensing element. So each platform will still be expected to be regulated in its own right. Um, but ultimately, if you fast forward, and I don't know how long it'll take, but if you fast forward to the end, not, not necessarily the end, but much further down, the whole point is a seamless experience for investors. Now, if you go onto Amazon, that's pretty seamless, right? Whatever you're buying, you know, it is a brilliant user experience. There will be many, many, many stepping stones to get to that seamless experience. One day, you know, I have a vision, one day we will have that centralized license. Everything will be, you know, one platform, one technology serving everyone so it can seamlessly talk to each other. Uh, as Jan said, it could be decentralized. Whatever it is, there's a hell of a lot more to think about, you know, in the process. So all of that is still to be worked out, but the end result should be a very nice, seamless process for investors. 
Sounds awesome. Adi, you wanted to add something or? Um, I, I, I didn't quite catch the name of the company that you mentioned. Did you say Eco Estate? Evo, Evo Estate. Evo, Evo Estate. Evo. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure I've come across them before, but my best guess is there are, they are probably an aggregator of some sort. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it's some kind of uh, or meter or marketplace. They are collecting um, project and originators. They, did they have to be regulated uh, themselves? They are, they are not regulated, but it doesn't matter because they are shutting down. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately, but the idea was great. Uh, but the um, you're um, you're trying to make a, a comparison um, between yes. uh, that platform and so obviously one uh, point to highlight would be that the centralized marketplace that we'd be launching would most likely be a regulated marketplace. The only two types of um, permission that you can get in the UK for that type of regulated marketplace is one, a recognized investment exchange. That is actually what the London Stock Exchange is. The other permission, a step down from that, but still an exchange is what's called a multilateral trading facility in MTF. Um, you have that same permission across Europe. Um, uh, we know that um, just prior to uh, Brexit, unfortunately, that was a permission that um, existed both in the UK and in Europe. So ultimately, the, the centralized marketplace that we'd be going for would have a permission of that equivalent in one of the established in one of the uh, countries, whether it's um, the UK or um, Amsterdam, sorry, Holland or, or France or Germany. Uh, we, we might, you know, this isn't something that we've discussed extensively, but based on my, as, as a group, but based on my experience, we'd, we'd have to pick a location to incorporate that uh, exchange in. And uh, ultimately the members um, would probably be shareholders in that um, exchange and we'd contribute our projects and investors to it and then hopefully grow it from there so i think there is a, a big distinction between that and a, and a an aggregator a non-regulated aggregator which is a, essentially a broker um that that wouldn't be the case with this exchange it'd be operating almost as a principal uh, regulated uh, entity hmm. and, with, and all the, with all the regulatory capital requirements you know, regulatory capital requirements of an MTF, uh, I think, for example, is something like 700 and something thousand euros. Uh, and as the business grows, you have to have further capital to cover something that's called, you know, wind down process um, uh, that we have in the UK. Uh, it's certainly something that uh, a regulatory format that we'd like to follow. Um, the one thing that you don't want when you're building, you know, our platforms or a central marketplace is that you know, not everything works out. Sometimes businesses don't work out and they have to unwind. Well, what you don't want is a disorderly unwind. Uh, you know, that that will not help anybody. Um, uh, it certainly won't help the investors. And, and we've seen that with early stage, some early stage platforms and some slightly more mature platforms, even in the UK market, uh, companies um, uh, ultimately going into administration. And that's because people have not thought about their operations. They have not set aside um, op, uh, capital to assist with the wind down process. They've not thought about the business risks properly. Um, and, you know, that's why we're not launching a central marketplace tomorrow, uh, because we recognize as a group um, that if it's going to be done properly, uh, it's going to take a lot of work and effort uh, uh, and, and capital. And that's something that we know we're going to get to at, at one stage. Uh, but by getting smart minds round the table, which we've started with and we'll continue to add to, we're confident we'll get there. Lars, I have a question for you. Of course. So um, as an investor, from a, having standardization, what's your view of that? Do you think that that would help? That was um you know and and if it would help there, would there be certain things that you would be looking for i think there are two types of investors right now in the community there's one type um, who are digging very deep into these projects and they would uh, of course appreciate some kind of standardization because they can 
then easily compare the projects under each other. There's also another type of investors, and um, I am also part of this one. So I'm just diversify um, over hundreds of projects um, with, with techniques like an auto investor, portfolio builder, some kind of this. So I don't check the projects itself. So I, I know, okay, there will be some default, five to 8%, let's say, and the rest will go through. So um, for me, it would be not useful, but uh, for a lot of investors of my community, it would be definitely useful to compare the projects under each other. I'm surprised you said it would last, because actually I think it's more useful for the people that don't delve deep into the project details. Yeah, if you're exactly. Deep because details, you're already educating yourself on something. Actually, what we're doing helps the more passive investor very quickly absorb yeah. information. And even if it isn't absorbing um, the investment description, you know, the risk rating in itself should very, very quickly tell you what you're getting yourself into. So I, yeah, I'm and imagine, no. yeah, imagine a normal auto investi which you use and at, at any platform, you know. So you pick some criteria. You say, okay, I want to invest, I don't know, one hundred euros each month to or to each of your product product uh, which uh, follows some criteria. But at every platform, it, it is different. So uh, if you have it uh, comparable, uh, this auto invest. Uh, functionality, I think it, it is amazing. So you can be at platform A and know that it is the same as uh, at platform B. You, you completely don't need to care of the detail of the project. Okay, yes, that, this would be helpful, yes. If the auto is, is the same on, on each platform. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know. In, in again, just, just to kind of add to that point, the, the single biggest problems with these kind of so-called marketplaces of the past and even at aggregators is, there is no centralized um, measure of quality, right? So a lot of the early crowdfunding platforms would, you know, connect A with B. A needs money, B's got money. They would put it on their platform and there's very little due diligence or oversight. No one's looking after the investor's interests. And that's why a lot of them fail because actually how the hell is the investor supposed to understand the risk on, on, on these projects? So that then takes us to aggregators. And once again, the, the issue is, aggregators are not tied into the underlying businesses in any way so 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 once again you have no check on quality uh, and no skin in the game in the process the beauty about arip and the marketplace that will be created is actually it's mutual ownership everyone has a stake in the platform the centralized marketplace as well as their own platform everyone there's a quality assessment done you can't just come and list your projects um, I mean, I've seen some aggregators recently where, frankly, they'll take projects from any platform um, and you look at them and you're like, has anybody actually looked at this stuff? And, and, and it worries the hell out of me because the problem is when these guys blow themselves up, it affects all the rest of us. What we want to do is stop the industry blowing itself up by having all the best players come together and do things in the right way. Um, and by having this mutual ownership and all of that stuff, it means you don't have a third party that's aggregating everybody else. We're aggregating ourselves, um, which then you know makes this a much more powerful marketplace for the future. Yeah, the beauty of this aggregator was that you just need one uh, login, one registration for uh, investing in 20 or 30 other platforms. I think it wasn't that much, but um, this was uh, very easy. Because otherwise, you have to manage a lot of platforms. But uh, and, yes, and it's closing down. Why? Uh, because um, I'm not sure exactly, but um, it was too hard for them to uh, combine everything and um, force the, the project originators to get reports and stuff like that. Um, so they are merging. They are not closing down. They are merging into uh, in Rento. This is another company we saw uh, yesterday in another panel. But I think they, they, they founded another company, which one of the founders founded another company, yes. which is a, like an originator. And now they are somehow like merged together or merge. I don't know. I don't know the detail, but I just what I, what I read. In the internet. But, but, but the bit that you mentioned last, right, it's 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 like a, a single sign on. Right. It's like going to a shopping center and having all the shops there in one place. Correct. That that's part of that seamless uh, execution and investor experience that we will eventually get to. You know, at the moment, remember everybody uses different technology. 
um, and uh, you know you're not going to suddenly get everyone using the same technology, but eventually you will get to a point where you'll have single sign-on across all the platforms. You'll have a centralized marketplace. You can either go into the shopping center and see all of the platforms, or you can go directly to the individual platform. So all of those kind of niceties will definitely happen. But before we even get to that, you've got to get the quality right. Yes, no more words. No more words needed to this, I think. <laughs> Okay, maybe let's come to the next important part of this uh, session where we want to take a little bit deeper into Aery. Um, you already mentioned it several times. You developed some kind of uh, risk rating. Can you explain a bit more about that and about the content? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, what we did is that uh, based on the data we have uh, or how we standardized information about project, uh, what we put together is that we took our projects and we created a huge spreadsheet where we like based on some criteria we 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 began with like comparing our projects among uh, among ourselves and in the next step we've uh, identified the key uh, metrics which uh, are crucial for each each investment and based on that we started to uh, evaluate these criteria and um, give them points and based on what we we created a scale uh, imagine the scale for bonds from triple a to to c and by comparing many projects we have like fine-tuned uh, the model so that's how the model works based on many criteria it gives the final risk score of each project and for that we as well need more uh, participants more data that we can be constantly improving the risk model based on the experience of uh, other other platforms other types of projects and uh, so on okay anything to add or i mean i'll i'll, I'll just add that you know we're, we're... You know, everything is down to the sample size, right? So we had a good number of projects to begin with. Um, and breaking the, the risk factors down into the various categories, as, as Jan mentioned, there was then a case of weighting the various risk parameters. And a lot of time was spending, sorry, spent uh, reviewing the, the risk weightings across all of these things to make sure there was consistency across all the projects. And remember, you're trying to compare first charge lending, second charge lending, equity, uh, asset investments, you know, all, all sorts of things. And across the whole board, you've got to make sure, remember risk ratings are a relative score. They're not, uh, a, 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 a triple A doesn't mean it's 100% guaranteed, but it means that a triple A is better than a double A, right? It's relative. So it was making sure that across the entire set of projects that we started looking at, that on a relative basis, the risk scores made sense. And then we, challenged all of them from multiple directions to make sure it could still stand up and it, and and eventually you know we got to a point where we could get it to still stand up you know and it, you know started doing uh test parameters as well with new types of projects to make sure that the risk score it throws out actually fits in the right position uh, amongst the kind of a to c scores so so it's um as with any risk score you know it is just an indication of risk but most importantly in this case, it's a relative indication of risk. So, um, for example, uh, you know, we, we focus on uh, real estate uh, equity and real estate mezzanine, which is junior funding. That's naturally going to be more risky than something else. So I didn't take it personally when a lot of our projects came in with lower scores because that's OK, because a lower score. But then you're, you're getting compensated because the return is much, much higher. So so it, it's all relative. You can buy a double A rated bond and earn seven percent or you can uh, buy a triple b rated bond and earn 20 percent. then it comes down to your personal choice you know and what most people end up doing is diversifying you know you always have a smaller allocation to the slightly more risky stuff you know and allocations across the risk curve uh, into the the middle and lower risk stuff so it's really about giving more color more clarity on what the various projects represent and also, um, there's loads of parameters that are considered for each of these projects and um, the calculations that go behind it. Everything from 
um, security from, um, you know, pre-sales of units, um, you know, what type of project is it? Is there planning risk? There are so many different elements that are taken into consideration. And each of these are then um, weighted accordingly in order to achieve the end numbers. Now, with regards to the risk score, um, and actually for us, it's it's a project rating. It's not necessarily, it, I don't think it necessarily reflects the risk profile per se. It's a it's a project rating per se, um, but that's, that's a personal view. Um, you know, it then allows people to understand that actually this one has um, a planning element to it. And so it will show as a potentially higher risk score because of it. But actually, there is underlying um, planning in place as a, as a fallback, for example. So each of these scores then gives you a flavor uh, for comparison purposes but it's always worth actually just even the one cheater going through the detail to say, okay, this is a rough view of what this overall project looks like. The highlights for all of that are then documented and available for investors to see. So you can then start learning about the different profiles of each of these scores. Um, so, and, and then it allows investors to then understand where they sit in terms of their comfort zone in each of these. So some people might not want to go for, you know, um, the very lowest bands available because that's just outside of their profile and what their comfort zone is. Um, others might say, you know what, it's actually quite broad. So by providing this information up front, it allows people to then start thinking about projects slightly differently and getting to the nitty gritty of it. Now, do you already use these ratings in your companies or is it still the draft? We're, we're starting to use them. So we've, we've, got, we've had all the calculations done. We're putting together the actual AREP one page sheet and they should be on our platform within the next day or two. We're, we're tracking it against um, what we currently do. Um, the transfer for us is actually quite a, in terms of process and operational change, it's, it's quite different. And so that's what we're looking. So we will um, be making sheets available um, until we could um, accommodate for everything, but we are tracking it internally. It's just not visible at the moment for all of our investor base. Yeah, uh, from our perspective, uh, we have already implemented that into our platform and we've been just waiting for uh, the official uh, ARIP launch, which officially, officially already was done. So uh, we will be displaying these ARIP ratings uh, to, to everyone uh, on the project, which uh, can be found on Brickhead. And of course, you want to communicate it more. So we will uh, put it into our newsletter that everyone knows that we are using the ERIP standard. Yeah, I think this is an important point that you um, teach the investors also that something is going on in the background that they can um, maybe compare easily the platforms under each other. Because otherwise, it may be maybe just maybe just a logo on, on the bottom of a website and that's all. But they have to know what is going on with ERIP and what is behind this. Absolutely. And before it was a huge secret, but now it's not. So now we can start talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what can I do exactly today if a platform is a member of uh, AREAP? Um, can I already compare show dream projects, for example, with the ones from, from British Pearl in, in the next weeks? Or how is it from the practical perspective? Yeah, pretty much. The, the, the one page sheet will have all the information, including the risk score. And I, I think we didn't mention this clearly earlier. Once we come up with the risk score, it gets translated to a rating. So it's like a range of scores get translated to a single rating. Um, but that's then stamped at the top of the page as well. So 
Um, so in theory, yes, yes, you can start comparing. There are three things that um, uh, investors will see on ARIP member websites. One that um, a platform is a member. Uh, the next thing that they may see is as soon as that platform has adopted the um, presentation standard, the investment presentation standard, uh, they'll see um, uh, a data sheet, an investment description that says a root compliant. And then the third, stage, sorry guys, the third stage, I don't know what, uh, the third stage um, uh, is that uh, if a platform then wants to start adopting the risk scoring process, um, uh, we've agreed, I believe we've agreed, obviously everything's still a work in progress to a degree, um, that the platform will be able to present um, a stamp that says ARIP rated. So ARIP compliant will demonstrate uh, the standards are being abided by. Uh, in, in other words, the investment platform is presenting their investments in, in the template that we've provided as a trade association. And um, if they then want to adopt the ratings process, which they don't have to, um, if they don't want to, if they adopt the ratings, they can then uh, highlight that there is uh, an ARIP rated project and they will communicate that rating on the project. So whether it's as we've said, triple A, single A, C, whatever the rating is, that will then be uh, communicated. So there's a degree of flexibility for um, new members of ARIP at the moment. Um, they can just become a member and show that on their website. They can become a member and adopt the standards. And then for each project, they will demonstrate whether it's ARIP compliant or not. And then thirdly, they can adopt the standards and the rating process and then add that third stamp onto their um, uh, website slash deals. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks for the insights, guys. Um, very cool. I'm really looking forward to see the first um, ratings and try to compare some platforms under each other. Um, before we come to the Q&A now, is there something we missed for the content part, something you want to discuss? Or is everything set so far for this? Yeah, I think we covered everything. Okay, no problem. So then, then let's come uh, to the Q&A. There are not that much questions. Um, we have some question from, from Carlos. Thanks, Carlos. Um, what is the biggest challenge for a reap technical, legal, or regulating aspect of the shared centralized marketplace? All of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hell of a lot of work to do. And, and remember, every, every uh, member is trying to build ARI while trying to build their own business. So it's almost like having a second business that you're involved in in that respect. So every one of those areas presents a big challenge and will require a lot of work and a lot of planning i, uh, I would suggest very, oh, sorry sorry carry on okay i just wanted to say it is very interconnected you know it goes hand by hand the technology the regulation with the expectation of members that's everything go, go, goes together so it's very complex and uh very big topic so it, it is very difficult to say to mention one uh, specific thing which is the top one or the most difficult one i i would say the regulatory piece and then the technology um only because we're crossing many jurisdictions and so to try and accommodate for that um is going to be interesting and then um, the technology will be um, a challenge in order to achieve the, the seamless integration, however that happens. So because that user experience is so important, we can't have it a clunky, web, um, a clunky marketplace. It just won't work. And so I would say those two things, um, they're going to be the biggest interesting pieces of work. 
Okay, thanks for answering. So we have another question from Christian. He asks, uh, sounds like an interesting idea. As was mentioned a couple of times, diversification is hard because comparing projects is hard. That's definitely my experience too, also because originators don't tend to have that many new projects. How often each of your platforms offer new investments, for example, how many new projects in 2022 and in 2021? Um, so, I mean on, oh, sorry, go on. I, took, sure. um, I was going to say for 21, um, we didn't have many. For 22, we would expect between anything between probably two and six projects a month. That's what we're ramping up to, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, on, on our side, because we're on the junior funding side, ours isn't a volume play. We, we tend not to knock out as many projects. So we probably put out one every couple of months. They tend to be larger as well, uh, so two to six million raise. So we tend to do about one every about, about every two months. That will become one every month or so soon. Um, but if we do start offering senior funding products, that you might get more frequent uh, products coming through mm -hmm. on that side. Yeah, uh, from my perspective, uh, we're not an originator of, of investment. So we are like dependent on uh, on our partners. And uh, based on that, uh, we are introducing like one or two projects uh, every week. I anticipate, Jan, um, uh, this is a question to you. I anticipate you expect your 2022 volume to be significantly higher than your 2021 volume probably as a result of COVID, would, would you say that's fair to say? Sorry, again? Uh, the, the, the volume of projects in 2021, I would expect to be lower than what you would anticipate the project volumes being in 2022. As a result, I mean, uh, as a result of COVID, would that be fair to say? I mean, uh, what we have seen uh, from the market in general was that uh, as COVID arrived, uh, there was like a huge uh, downturn in projects, but that was already in 2020. I mean, spring 2020 was that everything stopped. And after some time, I don't know, three, four, six months, the market went back, uh, I would not say to normal, but uh, was recovering. And 2021, from my perspective, was already much better about uh, what, what, we, what we saw from our partners. And I hope and I expect that 2022 is going to be much, much better again. Of course, we will see what the current uh, current crisis uh, in Ukraine will do with the market. We've already discussed that with a couple of uh, other platforms that, for example, they saw that uh, people uh, were, are more cautious or to invest in some projects that we will be already seen in the market. And I, I would maybe like to ask everyone, uh, have you had uh, such an experience as well that uh, currently something like that happens that people are more careful when, when investing online? I think over here there's been a few high profile failures which doesn't help the, you know what we're doing. But we have seen, actually, if anything, the opposite, growing interest in online mm -hmm. real estate investment, simply because you started from such a low base. Um, and no, you know, not uh, everybody's... Uh, really... Sorry, I mean, in general, yes, but I meant uh, with uh, the respect uh, what happens uh, in Ukraine. I mean, in the last month, uh, just in the last month. I think also proximity to Ukraine may, in terms of geographical proximity to Ukraine, would, would probably... Um, have a difference. So if it's a project in Latvia or Estonia, for example, uh, I'd, I'd expect uh, investors to be more nervous versus a project in London. Um, um, yeah, you know, given that there are concerns over those uh, bordering countries potentially being invasion targets as well, um, uh, my understanding. Uh, so I think proximity matters. Um, you know, it's it's a little, you know, when you're running and building your own business, uh, you're looking for stability uh, to grow. And it, it is frustrating when things 
uh, events such as Brexit, COVID, and now Ukraine, you know, all of these things have been almost happening back to back. Uh, and sometimes you feel like you're swimming against the tide and you're just hoping for um, some peace and sunlight in order to start uh, really pushing your business. The one thing that I would say, however, is if you can survive and grow during these periods, when you do get those windows of stability, hopefully you're looking for significantly um, uh, increased or exponential growth during those periods. Um, at the end of the day, uh, people need to put their money somewhere. Uh, and often real estate is an inflation hedge, um, uh, subject to there being no hyperinflation, uh, uh, obviously, and that affecting uh, lending rates in terms of mortgages. But um, real estate often uh, is also not just an inflation hedge, but also part of um, a people's portfolio allocation. You know, I want 10% of my wealth in equities, 30% in bonds, um, you know, maybe 20% in real estate. Um, and of that 20% in real estate, maybe I might do half of that direct and half of it indirect through some type of REIT fund or an investment platform such as the ones that we operate. So, you know, I, I'm more optimistic about this year personally um uh because i think there are a lot of uh, potential opportunities but you know if things escalate um uh in terms of ukraine and there being further th threats to europe and the uk such as uh, energy stability um you know if russia cuts off um energy supply how that will drive inflation how that will affect markets what can you expect people to divert their money into? Uh, people may not have the spare money uh, to divert into investments. They may have to divert it to cover living costs. If they have spare cash, where do they want to leave it? Do they want to leave it in a bank with a higher credit rating or buy gold or buy crypto? Who knows? Let's see what happens. Uh, but, um, you know, the people's investing nature is obviously subject to what's going on in the world around them. Um, one, of, one of the things that we've noticed a little bit is um, there's more of a demand and it's not that one's dropped off, it's one's just increased. Um, so we're seeing more people wanting to invest in sort of peer-to-peer -peer loans at the moment, fixed return, fixed period of time. So it removes any equity risk um, and then also sort of shorter term projects. So rather than sort of tying up your funds for two years or five years, whatever that number is, it's like they want, they're looking for investment opportunities, but maybe just a slightly shorter term one whilst the um, world figures itself out with all of these challenges that are being experienced right now. So there has been a shift but there are still um, people looking for investments. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's precisely what we're seeing. The, the actual activity from investors is very high, um, despite what's going on everywhere else. Um, and I agree with Annie, it's probably a proximity issue as well. I can confirm this also from my community. So people are going back from countries uh, in the eastern part of Europe because it's too risky and are searching for other opportunities. Yes. Okay, so um, there are no more questions, but maybe a question from my side. Um, guys, um, you mentioned that it's it is all a lot of work with ARI. Um, I would like to know from you how much time do you spend for ARI right now? Because for you all, this is some kind of uh, side hustle, I would say, right? Lars, it feels like years. Um, <laughs> so, but in, in all honesty, we're spending, we're meeting every two weeks at the moment for a couple of hours. Um, and that's been happening for over a year. And so that's quite a lot of time that's actually gone into it. But outside of that, um, where there are specific areas to be discussed, um, there have been separate meetings where we just or certain members needed the focus time to, you know, put a shell together for the standardization, for example. 
So there have been splinter groups as well, um, focus on specific activities. Um, and then as part of the, the regular meetings, we basically then um, sometimes have stuff that we all need to take away and look at. So there is quite a lot of time that's gone into it. I, I would suspect that um, as more members join, then um, maybe the frequency will change a little bit. So it's not going to be, because it's quite heavy in, in terms of time. And whilst two weeks, uh, sorry, two hours every two weeks doesn't seem like a lot, it really is a lot of time, um, especially for, because, you know, you, you're talking about sort of platform owners um, and so it is a substantial amount of time so we do maybe that will change a little bit now that these core things are in place but that's how much effort's gone into it so far a picture it's not really just the two hours is it it's the preparation no. uh, so it's the preparation exactly. of the hours. and then if there's a specific a work piece that needs to get done that gets done outside of those two hours you know, such as the website the website takes quite a bit of work all the content on the website needs to be i'm sure you maybe lars you put a website together before yourself um it's not even if it's a simple website it's still time consuming uh, making sure you've got all the comms um correct you know these things they all take time uh you know the work that goes into standardization outside of the meetings you know, meetings are really there to just identify what needs to be done. It's after the meeting that the work is done. So a lot gets done out of those two hours. You know, if I'm to throw a number out there, personally, it might be somewhere between five to 10 hours a week that I put on a RIP, depending on what the specific demand is at the time. Uh, but that's where I think it aver averages out. And even though we've been meeting every two weeks officially, leading up to launch in the last few weeks, it's been weekly um uh you know preparing for this event preparing for our press uh release um it, it does take time i'm not sure if that's going to become easier as new members join my suspect i suspect there's going to be even more demand on the committee members um whom you have around the table at the moment um so let's see what happens but at the end of the day it's all for our benefit so um if it if it works um, it should help all of us and for, um, when I say our benefit, our benefit as platform owners and then um, our, uh, hopefully for the benefit of the investors uh, that join us. Yeah, I, I don't want, um, so whilst it is heavy on time, yep. you know, we, we've done this on purpose. So but for new members and supporters joining, the commitment may not necessarily be the same. Um, and so it's just something to be mindful of. So we're not expecting everyone to sort of, you know, deliver half of their week every week to this course. It's just not going to happen. Um, and we fully understand that. So it's going to be in proportion. And as we've sort of said before, people can um, partake as much as they can. Um, but as long as it's understood and known from the beginning, then at least everyone knows um, how we can sort of make this work and how it all fits together. Okay, guys. So Ali is already gone. <laughs> I think we are also at the end of the question block. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed uh, the insights from our participants into the association of uh, real estate investment platforms. And yeah, thanks. Thank you all for your input and sharing your knowledge and very active discussion as always. And um, I hope we can continue this in another event and then have fun and uh, see you tomorrow on day three. And Brilliant. bye, Ali. He's, he's already away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank you so much. See you later. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.